All right, everyone. We are at the top of the hour, so I'd like to get started right on time. Uh, other presenters, give me a thumbs up if you guys are ready to go. I'm ready. Great. Got a thumbs up from Aaron. Good All right, well, we will. Okay, great. Thanks so much. We'll get started. Um, everyone, I am Maya Peterson, Member Services Director with INACAL. And on behalf of our team, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're excited to welcome several blended master teachers who are helping to build capacity in the field and um, are willing to share some of their instructional strategies with us today. So um, welcome to them. This webinar is just one of the ways that INACAL supports the field with research information sharing quality frameworks and policy development to continue to build that knowledge in the field as well. Um, this is part of our Teacher Talk webinar series and is particularly geared towards our practitioner community and closely aligns to our mission, which is to ensure that all learners have access to a world-class education and quality blended and online learning opportunities. A few housekeeping items. If you're new to Collaborate, you'll find the chat window docked uh, likely to your lower left. We'll be using that quite a bit today, so type your questions there responses or comments throughout, and we'll also monitor the chat room, <clears throat> excuse me, and have time at the end for Q&A. I am pasting a link right now to the presentation that is also housed on Google, so you can follow along there, and the links will be live on that as well. Again, we'll be sharing some of the links throughout so that we will be um, blending this lesson, and we will be toggling back and forth between the videos and the presenters. So. Be sure to keep your eyes on the chat room. Um, we are honored today to be joined by three blended master teachers. Um, we're honored that they're giving their time and expertise after another full day in the classroom. And so to introduce these educators, I'd like to introduce you to Jeff Liberty. He is currently the Senior Director of Teacher Development Initiatives at Better Lesson. He has more than 20 years of experience working in education and in his current role is responsible for defining and directing the blended master teacher project. He is also responsible for leading the design of Better Lessons Professional Development, which supports our blended teachers. So without further ado, Jess, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Maya, and uh, thanks to all of you who are joining us. I'm, I'm really humbled by the distances that are represented here in the many different um, geographies and the different roles that you represent. So thank you for taking the time, and thank you very much to Ben, Joe, and Aaron, who are um, three of our 11 master teachers for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to do more formal introductions in a moment. Um, as Maya mentioned, um, we are hosting right now at Better Lesson a blended master teacher project. Um, and I, I think I should say by way of housekeeping that now that we've chatted the link to the presentation and uh, because we are uh, blended educators, I have no illusions that everyone will follow along exactly as um, I'm going to be advancing the slides, but it would be super helpful if you're going to ask a question um, about any part of the presentation, just to ask it at the time in the webinar when we're covering that particular topic. Um, but do feel free to uh, work your way at your own pace through the presentation and or follow along um, with the slides through the webinar interface. Um, so having said that, um, I want to, I'm sharing right now Better Lessons mission, which is very simple. Um, we are all about making sure teachers are empowered to learn what works best for their students as quickly as possible. And we believe that there is urgency in public education now and has always been, but it's, it's acute right now both for teachers and for students. And so um, we have always as an organization tried to facilitate teacher learning and teacher development and most importantly teacher sharing. So all of our resources, and at this point we have about 10,000 hours of content available for free to all educators around the world, um, has been cultivated with a spirit of sharing. Um, in the beginning, we were a community sharing site where teachers could freely post their resources, ask questions of other educators, and so on. And we have maintained that identity after six years, and we call that our community site. Um, subsequent to developing the community site, which was a wild success, uh, we thought it would be good to work together with our partners at the Gates Foundation and at the NEA to create more curated content. And this particularly happened 
at a moment when the NGSS standards and the Common Core standards were coming online and teachers were being held accountable across the United States for standards that many of them had not seen illustrated um, through modeling. Uh, they were new, and at the same time, teachers were being held accountable for these same new standards, which are very rigorous. And so um, through our partnership with Gates and NEA, we started our master teacher projects. And to date, uh, we've done three content-based master teacher projects, ELA, math, and the science project, which is currently ongoing, where we document the effective practices of K-12 through teachers um, and their strategies and resources are all aligned to the Common Core and NGSS. Um, so all of that content, as I mentioned before, is available for free on, on Better Lesson site um, and always will be free. And that's our commitment to the larger community in education. Um, this year, um, the reason I was brought on board as a staff member at Better Lesson was to launch a new kind of project. Um, as I mentioned, we'd had the community work, which was free sharing, and we'd had our content-based projects. Um, all of which were very well received and very well supported, um, and all teacher-generated resources. But we had never done a project that was pedagogically based um, strictly, and our blended project is our first attempt at doing that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the Blended Master Teacher Project. You can find out more, by the way, uh, about the project itself if you click on the overview link that's in the slide that we're on, which is number four. Um, but and all these links are live in, in, the, uh, in the presentation. So I'll say a little bit. We were awarded a very substantial grant from the Learning Accelerator, which is a nonprofit nationally whose responsibility is and its charge is to create a blended learning ecosystem within five years in the United States. And we were selected because of our track record in documenting teacher practice um, to create a project that would make blended learning visible and accessible. Um, there's a lot of discussion about blended learning, as many of you know, um, in all kinds of areas of education. Um, but we like to joke, and I've been quoted recently as saying that blended learning has been up to now a little bit like a unicorn, something that uh, we all love to believe in, um, but hardly anybody has ever seen. And so our job at Better Lesson is to make it visible and make it's kind of demystify the practice of blended learning and make it very concrete for practitioners, as Maya said at the top of the webinar. So um, the, we were blown away by the interest in the project. We got close to 200 applications. Uh, we only had 10 slots to give um, for this initial project, which is really conceived of as a pilot. Um, we were able to stretch our budget to include a, an 11th teacher because we felt like three of our teachers who work at the same school in Los Angeles um, were really a unit in the way that they work and the way in which their, um, their content is presented on our site um, is really as a team and it would have been disingenuous for us to have chosen any one of them over any one of the others. So we stretched our budget and we got to an 11th master teacher in this project. And um, we had to create a whole new framework, which we call our blended learning taxonomy, which itself is evolving, as a way of displaying this content and, and telling a story about the very diverse practice um, that exists across our master teachers' uh, work in, in their different contexts. Um, so the taxonomy was meant to be um, very accessible to anybody who would be interested in exploring the content, um, sort of a blueprint for our user interface and then also elastic enough to represent the practice of any teacher in our project. And I think that we have um, succeeded in creating such a taxonomy. So you can check that out in the overview and the other grantees from TLA if you like um, as we go along. But our, our master teachers were given three basic charges. Um, they are to, as all of our master teachers are, to document and explain their practice. And they do that um, first in a set of Google folders that we call um, the garage, and any of the MTs on the call tonight um, can speak to that if they like. Um, their other charge is to be filmed professionally, and this is a very important aspect of the project. Um, we have created up to now 53 high-definition videos shot by professional videographers and edited professionally as well, so that the sound and lighting quality is really excellent. Um, we have multiple cameras in the classrooms, as the teachers will tell you. Um, and the goal there is to really 
make it plain what each strategy or each blended learning uh, practice looks like um, in the classroom and then our, our classroom footage is bookended by teacher interviews where the practices that you see are explained and introduced by the master teachers and then reflected upon afterwards and that's sort of our video packaging methodology. Um, they are also encouraged through the project to collaborate with one another. We meet once a month as a full cohort through uh, virtual hangouts and um, also to develop their practice through a teacher development process we have launched at Better Lesson called Teach Cycle, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, up to now, we've met every second week in uh, content teams, smaller teams uh, of three to five teachers. Um, we're going to a three-week loop just because uh, we have to give our math teachers some relief, and they've asked to meet just a little bit less frequently um, because they're an amazing group of very, very busy folks. So. Um, those are the project components, and later I can speak to any one of those if you like. Um, I want to jump now to talk a little bit about the user interface. So as I mentioned, our taxonomy is the blueprint for this UI. Um, at the top banner, uh, you can't see it very well here, but if you click on the link um, in, to the homepage link, you'll be able to access the full site. Um, you can get access to any part of the Better Lesson catalog, all of which is free. Um, you get a very short textual description of what the project is, um, and you see the, the lovely shining faces of the 11 MTs in the project, how many um, strategies they have to date in, uh, up on, on the site and live, um, and the general learning environment where they teach. Um, so, there's another, uh, the other aspect of the, um, the home page for the project is that you see the timeline in the bottom right, um, and you see the, a form where you can request more information about working with us if you so desire um, through the home page. So that's the, the, the project home page. And then if you were to click on any one of the master teacher's faces on the home page, you would get to his or her uh, master teacher profile page, and uh, in this case, this is Tanisha Dixon, who is not on, on the call with us tonight, but she is a fantastic middle school social studies teacher in Washington, D.C., and these are the five strategies that Tanisha has um, created for the project up to now, and you can see that the, um, each of the strategies bears a colored um, tag, and that is one of the topics in the taxonomy that this particular strategy is most associated with. Um, as you might imagine, uh, our strategies don't always fall neatly into one area of the taxonomy or another, so we've sort of made a choice to associate them primarily with one or the other. Um, going forward in the spring, we might have the capacity to double tag, which might make more, more sense. But you can see all of Tanisha's strategies. You can get to any of the other master teachers in the left-hand column. And you also can, by clicking on the About Me tab, which is the darker green um, shaded rectangle next to the strategies tab, you can find out a little bit of biographical information about each of the master teachers who is in the project right now, and they all have really amazing stories to tell um, about their, their lives and their, and their perspectives as educators. So um, that is the master teacher page. And then once you click on one of the strategies um, pictures, or you click on the title of the strategy, in this case I'll, I'll say opening bell in the upper left-hand corner, you get a video overlay and you can play the strategy video and you can read um, with a little bit more size the description of the strategy itself. And um, so that's the basic shape of the user interface for now. I'm going to say a little bit more um, towards the end of the webinar about what's coming in the spring, but I'm going to pause now and just take any questions. And, and Maya, I'll ask for your help if you see any questions pop up in the chat box about the project, about Better Lesson, um, how we selected teachers, any aspect of the UI, anything I've set up to now, I'm just going to pause and take questions. All right, folks, so if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat room or raise your hand and we can hand you the mic really quickly.
Um, this is not your only opportunity to ask a question, so I, I, I think um, just for the sake of getting to our, our fabulous teachers, I'm going to move along um, to the next slide. And I want to introduce Aaron, who is an amazing math teacher in Brooklyn, and he's going to share a little bit about himself and his model, and also he's going to share uh, a strategy video with you that he's chosen for you to view, and just understand that we're not going to play the videos, in this case, through the Blackboard interface because it would slow everything down. We are going to, thanks to Maya, chat the link so that you can watch it, but you can also get the link directly through the Google Slides um, document that we've shared with you at the top of the webinar. So Aaron, please take it away. Okay, hey, I Nicole folks. Um, I thank you, Jeff, and it's really an honor to be sharing with you all tonight. I really appreciate all of you being here. And um, I actually presented on a teacher panel at Ina Call at the conference this past November. So apologies to anyone if you've heard a lot of this before, but I really hope the resources and videos on the Better Lesson site, not just my own, but all the amazing teachers that I'm that I'm working with, can be beneficial to you and your students or your communities, whatever whatever role you're in. Um, so again, my name is Aaron Caswell, and I am a 6th, 7th, and 8th grade teacher at Middle School 88 in Park Slope, Brooklyn. And these days when I say I teach all three, um, most people who I say that to look at me kind of funny because they, they think, like, how can you possibly teach all three grades at one time? And the big answer is because uh, I work in a blended model that helps make that possible. Um, I'm also a very proud Math for America fellow, um, so just wanted to throw that in there. but. Um, this is the third year that I've led an amazing group of six colleagues in the School of One, or sometimes it's known around the country as Teach to One, a uh, blended learning model. Uh, School of One basically allows students to learn at their own pace in a totally redesigned classroom. We took three classrooms, knocked down some walls, and you know made this large space. So my extra large classroom fits well over 100 students, and there are different centers around the room. So. Um, every day, both the students and I are assigned new lessons in one of seven different learning modalities. So there's virtual instruction or reinforcement, which you can imagine is just kids learning from an assigned lesson on a computer. They have headphones, they're taking notes, that sort of thing. There's independent practice, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, small group or peer-to-peer -peer collaboration where kids are assigned a specific group and activity and they have to work together with little to no direct instruction from teachers, and I play a role uh, more of like a coach. There's live investigation, which is a direct instruction or some kind of uh, teacher-led investigation. And then there's a project uh, modality. And basically, the next day's lessons that students are assigned are based on a daily assessment that, that happens at the end of each day's class. So, and that happened just today. All the kids took their assessment, and I guess when we're done with this webinar, I'm going to log into my portal and see what lessons I'm assigned the next day. But I'm given lots of resources and stuff like that. I'm not shooting in the dark. Um, but it is a day-to-day -day thing. Um, so it, it can be kind of tough because I don't know what I'm teaching until the night before. But um, I just really draw on my, my teacher bank. And I have a lot of lessons. And I've done a lot of this stuff now that I'm in my third year that I have a lot of stuff to call on. Um, so essentially, my colleagues and I do the teaching, and and this answers a big question about, you know, I always get, are the computers teaching the kids? And no, what the computer and what this grouping algorithm is doing is assessing the students, and it's over 300 students because I have about 100 per grade, and then regrouping them on a daily basis. And that's something that I can't do, but I deliver the instruction, which I think, um, I think I do it better than the computer a lot of the times. Um, and the students move at their own pace. So there's so many fine details, but that's the general overview. And I wanted to give you a quick note about hardware for any of the, the tech people out there. I know there are some of you. Um, each student has a laptop. They're not always using it because some of the modalities uh, don't require it, like a small group collaborative activity or direct instruction. But we want the students to have responsibility, and so they carry it around, and they always need it, need it for their daily assessment or to check their... Um, any any detail you can imagine about their math class, homework, when their next test is, what their history, you know, how many points they've gotten in this unit, all that stuff is all they can get that through the laptop through through the website. Um, 
Aaron, there's a couple of questions. So I just want to reiterate. Quickly, sorry. Um, did, are, are the uh, devices provided or do they bring their own? And then a question around assessment. Is it curriculum-based, normed, or IIT scaled? Yeah. Um, so we provide the laptop. It's, it's provided by the school. The school purchased a big lot of laptops when we um, originally implemented the program. And is the assessment curriculum-based? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what RIT scaled is, but it is specifically designed to assess what they learn that day. That's the daily assessment to see if they're ready to move on to the next skill. And then they'll have an assessment once every two or three weeks, like a unit test. And it's all uh, aligned to uh, the Common Core standards, and that's really what we're following. So I hope that uh, answered the question, and please feel free to jump in with any other any other questions. Um, I got to say, w w the students with the laptops, the, having these laptops, and they weren't set up the best at the beginning, so this one-to-one -one laptop where you get all these functionalities with a laptop that you don't really need, I think ideally the students could have just had uh, some type of tablet or even like a Chromebook now I think is the ideal solution, but a, a, like a heavy laptop has been a bit of a janky solution. It, it hasn't worked out the best, but, you know, we, we make it work, but we have to do a lot of fixes on the laptops um, all the time. Um, as teachers, we get um, iPads, which I also don't really care for. I end up just using a MacBook Air that's my personal one because the just the way the portal, the website, interacts with my MacBook Air, I just find it, it works the best. And if any of your Mac users out there, maybe you feel the same. But I just always find that those Mac laptops work the best with, uh, with anything, really. Um, so just to wrap up, I just want to make two points about my model. Um, you know, two big observations that I've seen since the program started. Um, one is that students who performed at the lowest levels are making the biggest gains because we're meeting kids wherever they are. So sixth grade students who are coming in on a fourth grade level, we're meeting them there, and they are making the biggest gains. Some of them are, are gaining as much as a grade and a half or two grades in one year. And seeing the data that shows that was really, really exciting. Um, and number two, students are just more engaged than ever in this model. They, they really like the model. They're clearly being met where they are. I, I never see kids bored or overwhelmed they're not, it's not like every one of them is loving math every day, but they are where they need to be in their learning path. And that's, that's awesome and, and really nice to see every day. It makes it kind of a pleasure to teach. So, well, Aaron, thank you for, for sharing that. Would you like to um, introduce targeted intervention as a strategy? Yeah, sure. Um, so one thing, if you're looking at that slide right there, you see me, um, this is actually in a virtual instruction sec uh, session, so you can see a little corner of a laptop, and that was some, some student right in front. But basically when I go into this virtual instruction session, I act more as a coach, and I get a bunch of data from the daily assessment from the day before, so I can see who's struggling, how much they're struggling, what they got on that five-question quiz, and this particular student, Chris, um, I knew he was struggling on this particular skill, so my general thing that I do in there is any students that are struggling, I will make sure that I spend a couple of minutes with them. And you can see how I target them if you watch the video. And there's always, uh, you know, the mix is different every day, but there's always at least a handful of students that are seeing a skill for the first time. And my general policy and my colleagues' policy is to let them go on their own. They know how to take notes. They've been trained on that. So they go for that. And while they do that, I can spend more time with less kids and do that targeted intervention. And if you check out the video, you'll see I spent some time on um, some fractional stuff with him. But it's nice to be able to allocate my time better um, with the data that I get from the daily assessment. So that's more of a technical one um, and, and more of an academic, um, I would say. And then, Jeff, do you want to go to the next slide and I could introduce the other video? So we're going we're gonna to hold the other video for now, Aaron, until the end of the call. But um, I think what we ought to do is allow the um, participants just to have a, a couple of minutes to watch the video, and then I think we're going to move forward in the presentation. Sure. So just to clarify, um, You'd like people to 
view the targeted intervention video that I uh, posted the link to. Is that correct? Yeah, that would be great because okay. I think um, having watched the video, you'll have a sense of the project and this particular strategy. And so when we get to the Q&A at the end, uh, you'll have a moment to, you'll have some context to ask Aaron a question about that particular strategy. Great. So the link is posted here, or if you're following along on the um, presentation posted in Google, it's live there as well. So I have a general sense of how long um, Aaron's strategy video is, but can you please give a uh, thumbs up when you have finished watching the video? All right. At this time, I'm going to move forward um, just so we make sure to give Ben and Joe some mic time. So I want to introduce Ben Siegel who is a geometry teacher at Humanities Prep 2 High School in the Bronx. And Ben, welcome. Hi. Like Aaron said, um, it's uh, such an honor to have everyone uh, on this uh, conference call. And I have to say, I also visited Aaron's classroom. And when I saw it, it was absolutely incredible. So everything that's going on there, it's just an incredible experience. And what's going on in that classroom is it's truly amazing. So to give a little background on myself, um, my name is Ben Siegel. I work at a charter school in the South Bronx. I'm a 10th grade geometry teacher. Um, I just moved to my school two years ago. And to be honest, I was struggling hard in this environment. It was totally new to me. Students were coming in about three grade levels below. Most were, you know, we had some who were as low as five, six grade levels behind. And my classes were completely out of control. Um, it was just impossible to engage the kids with this diverse background. So as much as I differentiated my lessons, it was hard to hit everybody. So by October, I was like, I, I can't, I can't teach like this anymore. It's impossible. I went to my AP complaining, like I, I can't keep lecturing, I can't differentiate, nothing's going on in my classroom. I don't know what to do. And at this time, luckily, there was this article in the New York Times about the algebras. Um, who are using this thing called the flip mastery model. And I had never heard of it before, but you know, I read the article and it sounded exactly what we needed. Basically, the flip mastery model works like this. You pre-record all your lessons. You upload them to a course website. Kids watch them at their own pace. Uh, when they watch the video and done some practice problems, they take a quiz. If they pass, they move on to the next lesson. If they don't pass, they take a correctional assignment and retake the quiz. This way using this model basically let our kids kind of spend the time they needed to master every concept. So we tried it out. We just, you know, threw away our old lesson plans and just started using the algorithms content. And it didn't go perfectly because their content was not scaffolded to the point that I could read it, but I saw the potential there. Every single kid was engaged with the material. When they didn't understand something, for the first time I saw them re-watching videos, going back, really trying to understand the material. And it really shifted the, my relationship with students. And that was the big thing, where I was no longer an authoritarian figure, where I had to push kids to learn. Now I was someone on the side coaching them and really helping them achieve their goals. So we kept trying it. It didn't really work because, like I said, the curriculum wasn't totally um, matched our students. So I said, next year when I do this, i got to create it completely myself, start from the ground up. So this year, I've uh, designed my whole own curriculum, recorded every video myself, you know, made every single problem designed for my kids, and it's been great. Each kid is having their own kind of individualized learning experience. They are moving at their own pace. They're engaged and excited about it, moving through the curriculum. And these are kids who traditionally haven't had success in mathematics, 
who come in really hating the subject, who have failed for many years. And this year, we're just seeing the light bulbs go on. Ben, thank you for that introduction and, and description of your practice. Um, would you like to say a word about the strategy video that you've selected for the webinar? Yeah, this is a um, this is an introduction to mastery-based learning. It basically gives a little background about what mastery-based learning is and how we implement it at the school. And um, can you say a little bit about the gentleman to your left in the photograph? Yes, that's my co-teacher, uh, Mr. Elizondo. Him and I work together in the classroom. Um, we're in a co-teaching model. And yeah, he's incredible. He's a great teacher. Well, you both are. So let, let's take a minute as a group and folks can click into the link that I think Maya will have already posted in the chat uh, box about the introduction to mastery-based learning video. And when we resume, we'll, uh, we'll go to Joe Paraiso. So before we move on to Johanna Parizzo, I want to ask um, if anybody has a question that they want to ask Ben that they haven't asked already in the chat box. So Ben, do you see that question about recording your uh, own content? Ben, I'm not sure your microphone is enabled. Uh, did you see the question about your record? Oh, you're, you're answering it in the chat box. Okay. Oh, yeah. There you go. So you know what? We, we'll move on now, and let's just keep it fluid. And as questions come to you, please feel free to post them, and we're going to have an, a more open Q&A time. But I do want to, at this time, invite Johanna Pariso from Fremont High School in Oakland into the conversation. She is a high school ELA teacher and a phenomenal person, as the other gentlemen are as well. And Joe, welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the welcome. Um, so as Jeff said, this is I teach English in Oakland, and this is year 13 for me in the classroom. Uh, 11 of those uh, years have been here in Oakland, and then my first two years I spent uh, in teacher boot camp in Boston. Uh, I've taught 9 through 12, but at this point, primarily, I have seniors, and uh, those classes would be English, creative writing, and I also teach a senior research class. Uh, I guess, personally, I'm a mom of four, uh, two of whom are in high school, so I'm constantly surrounded by teenagers and the wonderful joy, joy that they are. Um, I guess in terms of blended practices, uh, my methods include a mix of the face-to-face the -face driver model, slash rotation, slash flex model. Um, so it's a blend of the blended. Um, and resource-wise, I think it's important to mention that I do have a Chromebook cart in my classroom where I have 33 Chromebooks. Uh, but even before I had that resource, this year I was kind of going rogue in my classroom and uh, bending the archaic rules uh, our school has, our district can have, uh, regarding electronics in the class. Uh, so that night my students were using smartphones and netbooks um, donated by Safeway. But a lot of times you had students that were using their smartphone to say access a Google Docs 
um, or text me answers or email me something. Um, so wherever I could uh, incorporate students using technology, I did. At the same time, it's not completely, it's not all technology 24-7. Because, I don't know, I find that with an English classroom especially, you know, they're, they're, the students need ways to process that in our, it's very necessary to have the face-to-face -face communication. So uh, the framework in which I teach does involve literary theory, uh, and that means blending gender-based theory with psychoanalysis, Marxism, post-colonialism, as uh, to help the students question and write about literature. Uh, one way that blended learning and practices really help is when we, when we consider presentation and oral communication and all the key skills that are associated with publication. Uh, and that's huge in my space with the kids. And that's where I find a lot of opportunity to offer the blended methods. In the end, the goal is that the students can uh, use online tools that I'm introducing to then create ways of teaching peers and ways of teaching others outside of our classroom. And uh, so that means that I'm just a push for things like Google Drive, the basics, or even more targeted personalized learning tools like the Guru platform, uh, which is I have one strategy on my my page on Better Lesson that uh, where you can see my students using that platform. Um, I don't know. Being a part of this project, it's it's really energizing at the very least to see what all of these other amazing amazing educators are doing uh, in their own classrooms, specifically in elementary school. Um, Wow, when I think about, I have a, a, a seven-year-old as well, and so the idea that uh, students can, how, how they can use blended tools um, and, and use different learning environments than the one I was raised in years and years ago um, is, is really empowering and energizing, and I wonder how my learning might have been different. So I guess that's what I can say about myself um, in a nutshell. Um, and I can go, I guess at this point, to the strategy uh, that you see on the screen there, and maybe just to give some introduction to that. Um, one of the best strategies I've, I, or strategies I've had the most success with has been moral reasoning conversations, which really has nothing to do with technology, but it does have to do with um, using the classroom, and, and I, I, we run on block periods here, so I have 92 minutes in which uh, we can do a whole heck of a lot. Uh, so the strategy you see there is called a, a moral reasoning conversation. And in it, my kiddos are given a scenario where they have to, uh, and, it's, and it's kind of like an, an ethical scenario. And they have to have table conversations with each other. Usually, if you notice that in the, in the image there that you see Chromebooks on the, on the table. So we do a warm-up, uh, and it's usually online. And then that warm-up could be done via Google Form. Um, it could be a journal entry. It can be a table conversation of itself. It can be the, the, the classic method of writing in a notebook. Uh, and, but in this case, what, what preceded this moral reasoning conversation was uh, a peer-to-peer -peer scoring. So that's why you'll see the Chromebooks on the table there, is that I, I am a big believer in students being able to assess each other's work and giving authentic feedback. That's a, a huge facet of the class. And after, after this, so the actual strategy you see there, uh, the students are discussing, having a conversation about, uh, that'll lead them into a larger Socratic seminar involving Native Sun. So that's a text we study in the fall. And um, in it, the kids are given an ethical dilemma, and then they have to kind of grapple with it in their tables. They share out, and then I kind of throw a wrench into it. So it kind of continues to keep the thinking going. And, and by a wrench, it's, it's something where I might hear something in their conversation that I, I think all the kiddos can benefit from, uh, something that will push their thinking. So in this case, the moral reasoning conversation was about uh, being on a, on a lifeboat. And, and who would they actually save if there were 32 people to save and there was only seven spots on a lifeboat? Um, and then the, the amount of, number of answers, different answers you can get, and these conversations are vast, and then you throw a wrench in there, such as uh, all the kids that, all the people that uh, you want to save are all children, which they never would have considered. So I find these provocative conversations are really great for leading into the, the deeper content conversations when we get to a Socratic seminar, um, because in this case, it's taking a, you know, a blended environment also involves, like, how do you move from 
a single conversation to a peer to peer to a whole table to the entire class and rotating that through. Um, and what it does is it does make my Socratic seminars richer when we start with this particular method um, to have the students kind of generate the juicy thinking. Um, so um, that's what's on my slide. Um, and I welcome any questions. So why don't we why don't we do this? Give folks a, a second to view the video okay. itself that um, Maya has helpfully chatted into the chat box. And then if you have questions for Joe, please cue them up in the chat box. And we'll see you in a couple of minutes. I'm just making a healthy uh, guess about when folks may have finished watching Joe's uh, video, the more reasoning conversation. And in the meantime, I wonder if um, I don't see any additional questions. I do see some praise. Oh, here's here's a question um, for perhaps all three of you about um, the physical classroom and are, are your kids in your classrooms every day? Um, so maybe each of you can take a stab at that question. And I also see a specific question for Joe about the blended aspect of the moral dilemma um, discussion. I wonder if you might address that, Joe. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to jump on this and say, like Ben, my students are there every day, and it is required. You know, the students are attending school very much like a traditional school. It's just a different model within um, a public middle school in Brooklyn. So even though there's capabilities for students to do work remotely and they have resources and stuff they can use outside of the classroom, they are required to be in the classroom. and. Um, especially for the program to work properly, they need to engage with other students within the classroom. Um, and in terms of my kiddos in Oakland, I see them uh, for two block periods, so we're double blocked. So I'll see them either twice in one day or once every day, at least for 90 minutes, if not longer. Hey, Joe, while you have the mic, would you mind addressing the question about um, the blended aspect of the moral reasoning conversation strategy? Yeah, for sure. I was trying to do it in the chat. I'm realizing I should just say something. Um, so in the context of the whole class period, um, oh, sorry, that's our announcement. Um, in the context of the whole class period, this was one of the activities that occurred within um, the whole 90 minutes. So beforehand, in terms of blended, like they were mixing technology and the kids will accomplish their warm-up or their do now online and then we switch into the convert, uh, small group conversation and they might do an ending, uh, an online journal and then they switch back into a whole group conversation. Um, and so, yeah, in terms of my blended method, it's more like shifting the environment as well so that they, they go to technology but then we use small groups. Um, then go to a whole group, and then go to a writing. So that, that's kind of what I mean when we, in terms of blend it, we just shift the environment a lot. Thanks for that, Joe. And I wonder if, um, you know, we have about five minutes left in the Q&A part of the webinar, and I wonder, Aaron, Ben, or Joe, if any of you would like to offer some general thoughts about blended learning, about the role of technology and community, about your participation in the project. Joe spoke to that a little bit. Um, any of those topics that are sort of generative um, and or kind of deal with questions as they arise in the chat box. Um, yeah, I, I want to throw something out there. Um, 
like any classroom, I think traditional or blended, there are so many moving parts and so many variables, so many things that play. And definitely in a blended classroom, there are more if you have technology involved at a, at a greater scale. But I, I always come back to the fact that in my blended classroom, and I know I'm, I'm sure I speak for, for Ben and Joe, that establishing a very strong culture at the beginning of the year is still like the bedrock of my classroom. Um, and, and it probably is even more so, like, you just need such a strong culture to have a different model like this for kids to do, an, basically doing a, a large experiment with you and go with you and buy in with you. There needs to be a really strong culture and community. And one, of, one aspect that I really appreciate about being part of the Better Lesson Project and uh, the resources that are available to you guys now is that they've wanted to document even that culture, like, I had a film crew in my classroom from the very, it was the first week of my school year, and they were documenting that culture, too. And I think that's just as important. So um, I hope you go after the tech stuff and see, you know, what strategies I use or any of us use um, academically, but also the, the cultural strategies that are on display, too, I think are just as important, if not more. Yeah, I want to second that because, you know, in terms of, of building a culture where you, where the kids are going to go all in, especially in our classes where a lot of our work is public, um, that's key. you got to have the kids willing to take the risk with you. And I, interestingly enough, you know, some of the students, they don't realize what they're getting into, but then when they see uh, that, they see their work on the outside. So my kids have been so amazed at being able to see their faces online and seeing that teachers actually are looking at, 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 at our classroom, it's kind of up their game as well. So even if it's not on Better Lesson and it's just within your own staff, being willing to share the work that's going on in the class and generating dialogue, that's been um, a fundamental piece towards like, kind of just upgrading my own practice and, and, and helping other teachers to see, hey, there are strategies out there, and, but it really does begin with establishing that trust with your students that, that People do want to see what their work looks like outside, that there's some type of validity and that there's some type of application in the real world. Um, and that's been very uh, that's been very powerful in this project. So I want to second what Aaron was saying about culture. And I would just say, this kind of goes along the line, talk culture that, you know, when you hear blended learning, people always associate with technology. But I always think of it as it, the technology allows for, you know, the relationships to develop. And it's you're no longer the authoritarian figure in front of the classroom, and you're no longer, you know, playing that traditional role of teacher. You're now just connecting with students, creating community, creating culture in your room, and, you know, really doing what you love as a teacher. Well, thanks to all. I want to um, just bring us home a little bit to talk about what's coming up in the project so that you know um, what you can look forward to in addition to the very substantial body of knowledge that our master teachers uh, have already created and shared. Um, one of the links that's in slide 13 is a user guide we've created. Uh, I was very hesitant to do this because I feel like uh, reducing these amazing educators to uh, three or four bullet points felt very reductive to me. Um, but I think it's fair to say that a number of people have some constructs in mind when they're looking for information about blended learning. And so we tried to, uh, we created this resource so that users of the site could navigate quickly to the things that they were the most interested in and hopefully along the way they find things that um, they weren't necessarily looking for but find very useful and provocative as well. So the user guide is there for you. Um, as Aaron mentioned, the first drop of content that went out last month um, was really focused on establishing the cultural conditions where personalized learning can take place and uh, self-paced learning can take place and where technology can be integrated without loss of community. Uh, and I think that each of the master teachers in the project up to now has at least one strategy, if not more than one, that demonstrates how that culture gets established in, as it gets established in any great classroom anywhere in the world. Um, going forward, though, I think those of you who are craving more technical insights into the hows and whys 
of blended learning, we'll be able to see the craft of each of these 11 master teachers a little bit more plainly. Um, their model will be fully explicated, um, and you'll just get more insights than you have already into the day-to-day -day practice of teaching and learning in each of these excellent classrooms. In addition to that, the new user interface in the spring will host artifacts, not just the videos that you now see, and there'll be more videos, but uh, teacher-generated artifacts as exist in all of blended, uh, all of our Better Lessons um, master teacher projects. Uh, so you'll see such things as unit plans, lesson plans, student work, user-generated videos from the teachers themselves, um, all sorts of things, screencasts. Uh, about aspects of the practice so that will make the videos come into more relief and in some cases there aren't videos of certain practices that are important to know about each of these teachers and all of that will be available starting in late April and early May. Um, in addition, Better Lesson has started to work with schools and districts um, to support their development of uh, their teachers' capacity to implement blended learning in their own context, in their own ways. Um, there's more information about that um, through the link on slide 13. And if you want more information about that or any aspect of the project, I invite you to contact me directly, and my email is there. Um, while I'm rounding up, I just want to say to all of you, thank you again for hosting us. Um, on behalf of the, the Blended Mass Teacher Project and Better Lesson, uh, it's, been, it's been a great honor. And I want to hand the mic back to Maya to bring us home. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, just a quick, a quick shout out to our teachers, Aaron, Ben, and Joe. Thanks so much. And Jeff, again, thank you. Um, the, the next screen just shows really quickly what next month's webinars will be. We have uh, Susan Patrick, the INACAL president and CEO, who will be joined by Justin and Amanda and Steve Kosakowski, um, who will be talking about the performance-based funding model. Um, and if you haven't gotten it or have gotten a chance to look at it, be sure to check out that report that we released last week. Um, and then on the 16th, there will be a teacher talk uh, focused on the hybrid rotational model with our friends um, in IU13 in Pennsylvania. So be sure to register for those. And again, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's probably been a long day for everyone, so we appreciate your time and attention. And um, if you ever have comments or ideas for webinars such as this, please don't hesitate to send them along, and I will share my email address in the chat box. So feel free, if you didn't get a chance to get any of your question answered, feel free to shoot them my way, and I will get them to these folks. And again, Thank you to our presenters, and thank you, everyone, for joining. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.